a LS3 6L80. I want to say thanks to everybody that watches my videos. I understand they're not the most dramatic or exciting videos, but I do try to put information out there. I've been doing general auto repair for over 35 years and engine swaps about the same amount of time. And I've come to find that a educated customer is a good customer. So maybe we'll talk about some of the myths and misconceptions about how these engine conversions work. There's a lot of different ways you can do an engine swap. Back in the day, in the 70s and 80s, you just put an engine in, hook up coolant temp and tachometer and some other signals, and that was pretty much it. Today it's a different world with the electronics that we have to deal with. So if we start off with the Hemi, essentially a Hemi is a Chrysler product. So it can use the OE Chrysler operating system and modules. If you take a JK with a 3.6 or a 3.8, and then you import the engine performance segment to the V6 PCM or ECM, there's some compromises there. When a manufacturer submits a vehicle to the US EPA for certification, there's a lot more than just engine performance going on. There's onboard diagnostics, and we've all heard OBD, OBD2. Basically, OBD2 is a second generation of onboard diagnostics where we're allowing the vehicle to diagnose the performance of the emission systems while you're driving rather than offboard diagnostics. Yes, we plug an analyzer in during emissions test. That analyzer looks at things like onboard monitors, and there's monitors for different segments of the emissions control system. You have comprehensive misfire, fuel, O2 sensors, EVAP. Some of them are more difficult to set than others. EVAP is particularly difficult to set because, in general, it takes several drive cycles for an EVAP monitor to set. Behind that monitor is all sorts of data that the US EPA has approved. The manufacturer has submitted this and indicated that if this monitor runs based on these tests, TIDs, PIDs, that that EVAP system can be assumed to be working properly. So this mode six data and other data in the background is running all the time. On non-production controllers, that mode 6 data is not there in most cases. You don't have to deal with it. And this mode 6 data is actually pretty invasive. And one of the reasons, I was talking to one of the Holly guys recently on the newer, uh, I think it's the ZL1, it's one of the new high output Camaros. GM chose to go with a non-production controller and get rid of the mode 6 data and make the vehicle not compliant on the road because the mode 6 data in the background just made things too complex and the computer could not react fast enough. So this mode 6 data running in the background that was approved by the US EPA has to monitor the engine that it was intended or designed for. So if you've got mode 6 data running in the background, and there's mode 8, 8 data also, and it's looking at a V8, but it was designed for a V6, those monitors aren't going to run. At least they might run, but they're not going to set or set properly. So these monitors were being turned off, which can be done. However, the Mode 6 data really is not accessible to us. The Mode 6 data is really engineering files that we don't have access to, so we really can't change that, and we don't want to. Now, the Hemi guys have made a lot of progress making the monitors pass. There's several approaches. One is to actually use a Hemi computer and allow the monitors to run and set the way they're intended. The compromise with that is the interface to the rest of the vehicle. If you go with a V6 computer and import the Hemi operating system, there can be compromises there with the transmission and mode 6 data. So the Hemi on the electronic side, I would say is easier to interface than most of the other options because it's a Chrysler product. Hardware-wise, the Hemi can be more difficult. It's a larger engine, it's a heavier engine. In most cases, it does require modification to the chassis, firewall, body. AEV did not want to hammer in on the firewall, so they moved the engine forward. The compromise with that is poor cooling or less efficient cooling and more weight in front of the axle. Burnsville moves the engine back, modifies the firewall. Both of them, in general, move the steering shaft. They cut the firewall, move the steering shaft over to clear the head. The early JKs, most of the time, you have to remove the battery tray, turn the battery sideways. The additional weight of the Hemi usually means you have to modify the suspension. The vehicle 
dynamics can change a little bit, especially with a tall lift when you're off camber. So there's some compromises on the hardware of a Hemi, but the electronic side can make up for that. If we look at the LS, Motec actually started working on the LS swap way back in 2008. Pretty much the same time most of the Hemi started to show up on the scene. And it was a daunting task to get an LS into a JK, but it had to be proven. It had to be proof of concept. The original JK that Motec did in 2008 was a 2008 Sport four-door with an LH6. The LH6 is a 5.3 with VVT and AFM, no flex fuel. Had a six-speed 6L80 transmission. After I completed that swap and got it on the road, I was simply amazed how well the LS worked in a JK. We had a lot of the industry guys come by, Curry and Phil Howell, and drive it, and they all agreed that the LS was awesome in a JK. The question was, how do we integrate it? How do we get everything to work? Because putting a standalone engine in a JK is actually pretty easy, but making everything work is a different level. We began to interface digitally and analog each system, air conditioning, cruise control. Now we did run a complete GM network, that's ECM, BCM, and TCM for a couple of reasons. One, again emissions, and two, functionality. The body control module actually serves a lot of functions in engine performance that guys don't realize. In the truck operating systems and even in, the, in most of the passenger cars, the body control module controls your tap shift, cruise control, has an effect on charging, power modes, that's waking up and putting your network to sleep so you have no draws, RPM match shifting, there's just a lot of, a lot of functionality in the BCM that if you eliminated it would have to be replicated. So we ran a complete network and we had full functionality. Was it easy? No. We basically had analog and digital integration where air conditioning and cruise control had inputs coming into a into a module, a bridge let's call it, and then going out to the other side. So we did have bi-directional control, we did have bi-directional communication, and it worked very well. The issue was the complexity. And as years went on, we refined, added functionality, and simplified the installation. Now we'll get back to that method of doing a conversion because there's another one that we want to look at and that's the hybrid. The hybrid is where you basically stay with the Chrysler operating system. In 2012 Chrysler added the WA580 to the JK. That's a five-speed transmission using a NAGS-1 controller and it's a much much better transmission than the four-speed. The 42 RLE really was a boat anchor of a transmission and the 3.8, while not the best motor for a JK, was really dragged down by that four-speed transmission. I don't think 3.8 was that bad of an engine in its intended application, like a lightweight caravan, but it was definitely out of place in a five or 6,000 pound JK. Had they added a five, six, seven speed transmission, I think it would have performed much better. In any case, the WA580 went into production in the JK in 2012. What some have done is put an LS in place of the Penstar engine then use the Chrysler computer to operate that LS engine. So essentially what we're doing, we're fooling the ECM to think that it's running a Hemi. Cam sensor, crank sensor, all are replicated in the LS engine, fed back to the computer. So the computer thinks it's operating a Hemi. Now the advantage of this is you can run the stock transmission with an adapter. You can add trigger wheels and other electronics to mimic the signals of the Hemi, put the LS into this vehicle, and it's going to run with the Chrysler Electronics. Therefore, you're going to have similar functionality to the Chrysler Electronics. Of course, there's a downside to everything, and running a GM engine with a Chrysler transmission is not compliant, of course, because the transmission is part of the emissions control system. You have bespoke and custom hardware to interface that engine into the Chrysler operating system, which is not going to be readily available at your local dealership, and it might be difficult to find servicing for servicing and replacement parts. So getting back to our methodology, we wanted to keep the operating system pure, the GM network pure, which we did. 
And the advantage of running our early digital analog interface is that we did keep it completely pure, no integration into the CAN network. The beauty of this is the GM side could remain completely GM and the Chrysler side could remain completely Chrysler. A Chrysler dealership could service the Chrysler side, a GM dealership could service the GM side. And we did this for many years. I've got actually hundreds of vehicles out there running this setup. One advantage of this setup is the GM side is not dependent on the Chrysler side for its operation. So if the Chrysler side were to fail, let's say the tip were to go bad, the GM side would go into a, into a standalone mode and operate. As time went on, it became apparent that this method of integration had to be rationalized. Not because it wasn't functional, but because it took a lot of time and effort to not only build these components, but to install them. And it was complex. A lot of guys don't know this, but we started working on a CAN interface in 2013. We actually had a two-channel bridge done through the CAN as far back as 2013. So originally we tapped into the engine performance side of the CAN network, and we still have access to that in our current setup. But we prefer to use a lower priority network, so we're using the interior network to integrate our electronics, and we'll go into that a little bit more depth a little bit later.